my team this morning, the Christmas story when love came down. When love came down. And I want to continue to focus on that theme this morning. I want to set it up against three verses that are often not often spoken of, but not brought into this context of the Christmas message. Well, listen to this. John chapter 3, verse 14 to 17. As Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He's talking about a world that is torn in sin, in pain, in wretchedness, in evil. And, and he says something needs to be done. The serpent is significant of the demonic. And Jesus is comparing what happened to the people in the wilderness. You remember? They were walking in the wilderness and, and, and the serpents came in and they were being bitten by the serpents and, and, and Yahweh told Moses, he said, put, put up a cross with a serpent upon it. And he said, when they turn and look, they will be healed. And so Jesus is looking and saying, that's the context of our world. The demonic is moving. The demonic is biting. The demonic is devouring. It devours at the womb at the highest level. It devours at the one-year-olds at the highest level. It devours children at the highest level. He said, but something needs to be done. And Jesus said that something has not changed when the demonic moves. Something needs to be lifted up on the cross as Moses lifted the serpent. And he said, the Son of God must be lifted up to make that change. And that's the only answer. But then he goes on in, and he says there that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that there was Christmas. God gave the Son. Hallelujah. I hope that your translation of Christmas is right in John 3, 16. When somebody asks you, what is Christmas? You simply say, God loved the world that he gave the Son. For what? There was a need. To lift something up before the world so that people might be saved. Hallelujah. Are you receiving the word just now? Catch that picture. It's not baubles. It's not lights. We have decorations. We have everything around us. Because God decorated our lives that Christmas. It was a painful Christmas in Jerusalem. It was a painful Christmas in Bethlehem. But today we celebrate because the sun was lifted up upon that cross. Again from Titus chapter 3 was 3 to 7. For it wasn't that long ago we behaved foolishly. You want to see what's happening? That context, why was somebody needed to be lifted up? In our stubborn disobedience, we were easily led astray as slaves to worldly passions and pleasures. We wasted our lives in doing evil with hateful jealousy. We hated others when the extraordinary compassion of God our Savior and His overpowering love suddenly appeared in person. What is Christmas? The extraordinary love of God suddenly appeared in person. In person. God didn't just send you a love letter. God didn't just send you a flower. God sent you a person, the person of His Son. The extraordinary compassion of our God and His overpowering love suddenly appeared in person as the brightness of a dawning day. He came to save us, not because of any virtuous deed that we have done, but only because of His extravagant mercy. In this, the love, again, 1 John 4, 9 to 10, another Christmas verse. In this, the love of God was made manifest amongst us. The love of God was made manifest amongst us. That God sent His Son into the world so that we might, hallelujah, we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but He loved us and sent His Son to be a, not away in a manger, not a little baby Jesus. No, no, 
No, no. God, there's, there is no birthday for God. The Bible says the incarnate God, the Logos, became flesh. He was there right from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by Him, and apart from Him was nothing created that was created. That God entered flesh, incarnation. God does not have a birthday. Let's get that and remember that clearly just now. Now I'm putting these three verses together. As we put these three together and try to understand them. Look at it and read the three together. For it wasn't long ago, led astray as slaves to worldly passions and pleasures. We wasted our lives in doing evil. And with hateful jealousy, we hated others. But God so loved the world. While we were lost foolishly in our stubborn disobedience, easily led astray as slaves to worldly passions and pleasures, we wasted our lives in doing evil with hateful jealousy we hated others. That the Father gave the Son. When the extraordinary compassion of God, our Savior, and His overpowering love suddenly appeared in Pierre's person, at the brightness of the dawning day, He came to save us. In this, the love of God was made manifest amongst us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Look at the implication. Jesus came. Why did Jesus come? He came as the propitiation. He came there. He, he, that I told you that Jesus' birth was not an easy one. With Jesus' dedication, when mommy and daddies come up on the platform and I bless them and I give them so much a promise to expect, Simeon came and laid his hand and dedicated to the baby and looked at the mother and said, A sword will pierce your soul, Mary. The same soul, she said, my soul exalts in God the Father. The, 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 Simeon said, that soul that exalts today, that is lifted up in worship, in exaltation today, a sword will go right through your soul. A sword will go right through your heart. It wasn't easy because he came and right at the dedication, what they saw was the propitiation. The one, the thing that was going to get lifted up. Hallelujah. That's Christmas. They saw what was going to be lifted up. They saw it. Obviously, I don't think they caught a life snake and tied it on the cross. In the day of Moses. They, they saw what was going to be lifted up. So that we may have life. Set that in the background. Set that in the background because I'm saying the Christmas story when love came down. That's what it's about. Love came down as an offering. Love came down to give itself for you and me. Love came down to be lifted on a cross. Love came down to be torn apart. And the more you tore that love apart, the more the fragrance filled the whole world. You only did it a favor because you could never destroy it. It's amazing that in persecuted places... Oh, I've been rejoicing with our, with our mission churches. We, we, we had another almost 12 baptisms the other day. It's like almost 65 baptisms in Christmas season. Come on, give the Lord a clap offering. If that doesn't excite you and me, nothing else will. I'm rejoicing with them. I mean, the, the river was just like three feet, and this guy with the buffalo and the boat and everything, they were together doing baptisms over there. They were in a barrel doing baptisms at Christmas season. God is on the move, and His love is being shed. 
And I want for us to understand from those three scriptures, there's one thing in common between the three of them. God's love came down at Christmas in person. Hallelujah. God's love came down in person. Hallelujah. I, let's look at that. The three uh, principles I want to establish, then I'll take this further the next Sunday. Three principles. And for those three principles, I'm going to the letter of 1 John. Number one statement from verse 8, from 1 John chapter 4, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. You've heard me tell you from from. Greek grammatical study uh, that, you know, very often when we say, I love you, then I is the subject, you is the object, and in the cases of the noun, the I is in the nominative case, and the you is in the uh, accusative case, so that it becomes the subject, and you make out the difference between subject and object by, by these differences. What is in the nominative? What is in the accusative? What is subject? What is object? This is one of the places in Scripture God and love are both in subject. So when you look at if, in terms of something that's object, and you say you, you, you look at it and say, that is an object. God is good. Goodness is, is, is there in God, but it is associated with His works, so it is outside. But love is not associated on the outside of God. For the first time, you have this crazy grammatical sentence that has two things in subject, which means they both are one and the same, and they share the same character. Father loves the son. Son is subject. But this is like saying father loves father. And, and, and it's difficult to work with that. And in this text, there's this beautiful understanding there where he says, God is love. You can't rearrange the order. You can't rearrange the order because we're talking about God and the first subject bears precedence over the second. God is love. Love is not God. Be careful of that. And I'm also very careful to say just now, that word love is agape. And it simply means selfless love. Can you tap someone and say selfless love? You see, the Bible's very clear about that. He doesn't call God by any other name of love. There are different words for love in the Bible. Filial love. Friends. Gentle friends. They're friends together, problems come, they'll run off. And, and, and Judas and Peter wanted to have filial love with Jesus. And Jesus asked Judas, do you agape me? Do you agape me? The third time he says, do you filial me? And Peter's crushed because Jesus changed the word and brought it down. He knew what happened three times with that cock and hen and everything else and the little girl. But even as you're looking at this text just now and you're understanding, we're looking at this, God, Jesus is not saying God is philea. Sometimes we think God is our dost. No. God is, is not eros. The word eros is there all over in Scripture in other portions. Eros is a dangerous love. The Bible says don't trigger eros. And I often tell the young people, I said, watch, we have media triggers everything today. Media triggers it. Why are they raping and killing women everywhere the place? Media, pornography on the media, watching the evil on the media. Marriages are breaking because husband loves wife and wife loves husband. When Eros gets over... In the first few years after the honeymoon, then they don't have anything else to love it. But God told the husband, love your wife, agape your wife when Eros is over. There's a different reason why those words are used there. 
Love your spouse, love your child, love your family, love your God, not with Philea, not with Eros, not with any of the other kind of loves in the Bible, but agape. What is that love? Agape love, we were hostile, we were angry, we were in hate. We hated people, we hated God, we walked away from God, we rebelled against God, and God looks and says, I will send you the fullness of love. Overwhelming love will take you out of your hatred, your anger, your jealousy. Are you struggling this morning? Is there something in your life you're looking at? Are there people in your philea list that don't come into the agape list? Beloved one, look at this truth. He, he, he says so beautifully. In fact, he says Any, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Again, in the TPD translation, the person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God. Because God is love, so you cannot know if you don't love. Hallelujah. You cannot know. You cannot know. The first thing about God is love. The first thing about God is not your sin. Many people say, God, and the next word is sin. If you are a sin-toned, sin-dwelling, sin-centered person, the God of the Bible is not for you. He says, that's what you wear. You've done all that stuff. And even when you were not looking at God, when you didn't want to have anything to do with God, God set agape in the midst of our evil and adversity. Hallelujah somewhere. Hallelujah somewhere. Hallelujah this morning. This is the gospel of Jesus. This is the gospel. Many people want to have a gospel where sin is dealt with. The Pharisees and Sadducees had a gospel where sin could be dealt with. And I'm looking into this text and, 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 and I'm looking at the understanding the, that God is a God of love. They departed from it. That God became a God of sacrifice, of money, of tithing, of giving, of temple stuff. And, and Jesus takes the whip and says, you turn my father's house into a house of thieves. Why? The father said... I will put my eyes on this place. I put my name on this place. My years will be in this place. You see personal presence? And he says, he told Solomon, my heart will be in this place. This, my house, is a house of prayer. House becomes a house of prayer for those that are drawn and share heart. Are you catching what I'm saying? Prayer is meaningless, absolutely meaningless for religious people. Beloved ones, catch this. Catch this, catch this. You cannot pray. Sometimes you can. So some of those guys, they used to tie the Shema on their heads, walk around. You go to Israel today, you find them. Big boxes, tied on the head, tied on the arms. Put their gowns on, walk. Up and down. But they don't see a God of love. They don't see a God of love. And life for me is walking in the love of God. Hallelujah. Are you catching it this morning? Christmas message. What's our Christmas message? What's our Christmas core? What's our Christmas core this morning? God is love. Say that again with me. One, two, three. God is love. He's agape. He's the kind of love you never see anywhere. He's the kind of love that looks at you and me and says, someone slaps you this side, turn the other side also. Someone says, walk one kilometer, go with him two kilometers. Someone asks for one garment, give him two. Because that's the way he walked with us. God is love. Prayer is a celebration of love. It's a celebration of love. It's a celebration of love. You cannot be, I cannot be in love with my wife and not tell her that. 
I got to tell her that. And, 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 and she said, she's uttering just now, you better. <laughs> and I want to tell her that. And I wake her up from her sleep in the morning with those words. I wake her up and tell her, the first thing I tell her every morning is, I love you. I want her to go to the last words on, on the bed is I love you. If I, if I pop off in the night, I want her to get up in the morning and know that my last words to her was I love you. And I make sure I do that. Because when you're in love, you speak. You speak, you tell, you communicate. You communicate. When we call, when we speak on the phone, we try to do our best even with our children when they go into school to remind them the last thing, love you. Is it because everything is going right? No. When everything is going wrong, I want love to come into the picture. When everything is going hard, even when I'm hurting, even when we had a little argument the previous night, I want to make sure that when I get up in the morning and I put love in the right place because I've done it, I don't know about you, but I put argument the next day in place. Justice, I need justice. You said 25 words, I will have my 50 today. I've tried all that stuff. It's about the truth. And the Lord looked at me and said, it's about love. And I often, I, I fought wars with people because it was about the truth. And I've not realized that while Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, God says, I am love first. And if you and I are sitting here in the church this morning, I want for you to know that when you came into salvation, it is not that, that sin stuff. The sin stuff went on the cross. And love came down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And love came down. That's Christmas. That's Christmas. The king of love came down. I'm looking at these scriptures and, and trying to hold them together this morning because, beloved one, it's, it's, we want to believe today that not one person will go back home without really celebrating Christmas. Your family will find a place of prayer because you are so in love with God that you tell Him. That you call on Him. That you communicate with Him. My house is a house of love. Oh, that we will love the place of prayer. The place of prayer. Tithing is not an indication of love. You can tithe without love, without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Oh, you can get baptized without loving, but you cannot love him without getting baptized. Love. You see, he spoke to them in Deuteronomy in, in chapter 6 and the whole of chapter 5 is thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make a graven image. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. All the thou shalt and thou shalt nots are, are listed one after the other in the Old Testament. And then when they thought they got it all, God said, now hear me in chapter 6 verse 1. He's turning it and he's saying, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. That you may do them in the land in which you are going to possess it. So Moses is referring to those 10 commandments. Then he goes in verse 3. And he says, hear, O Israel, be careful to do them, that it might go well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord of your fathers has promised you, in the land flowing with milk and honey. And then he switches in verse 4, and he says, I want to tell you why. I want to tell you how you'll follow them. He said, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Hear, O Israel, 
You do that so that you can take care of yourself. Take care of your affairs. Make sure your life is running rightly. But what's the switch there? He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. At the heart of everything that you are doing, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Hallelujah. Look at that next verse in verse 6. These words, all the Ten Commandments, I command you today shall be on your heart. On your heart. It's not going to be just tied up in the stuff on your head. This stuff is tied on their head while they reject the Messiah. You can, you can have the Shema in your, in your head but not in your heart. And that's the problem today. We want to theologize. The Lord our God is one God. The nations are pagans. Show that one God in the heart of love. You see, you will continue to look at that. And he's telling them, he's, he's, he's telling them very clearly. Listen, I've given you ten commandments. But I want you to know what the center, the center of of relating to your one God is you will love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Hallelujah. That's the core. That's the core. I always said the commandments are, are the, the edge, the, the wall, the fence. You, it holds you. You're going out. You want to murder someone. And, and he says, you shall not murder. But that does not mean to say you have a right relationship with God. And then you realize, I cannot do that. The Sabbath day is holy. Don't do that stuff on the Sabbath. And then, So what do I do? Turn back on the Sabbath day. Don't come. You see, they, they, they wanted to pride themselves and say, we don't kill. We don't, we don't covet someone else's wife. We are not committing adultery. We're not worshiping any other idol. And they wanted to say the fulfillment of the Ten Commandments was everything. And Jesus comes and says, you didn't understand the core. Father, which is the greatest commandment amongst those ten? And Jesus steps out of that and says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Many people think, don't make another God, don't make any idol, don't make an image. It's the greatest. It's not. And we sometimes believe that we will make it. We are chosen people of God because we don't make images. But the heart of his people was far from him. Look at him. He says, he says, this is what? These are the words I command you today and they shall be on your heart. While the Ten Commandments were on a stone, the Father said, Put these words in your heart. What were the words in the heart? You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Hallelujah. And, but the Jews wrote the Ten Commandments on their hearts rather than this. And missed out on the Messiah. Look at what he says. And all these words I command you shall be on your heart. You will teach them to your children. You will talk about them when you sit in your house. What? Love the Lord with all your heart. Love the Lord with all your soul. Love the Lord with all your mind. Look, I love the Lord with all your strength. Today, family communication is what happened at school. Did, 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 uh, what marks you got? Did you get first class? Did you beat out the neighbor's kid? Were you at tuitions? You can be successful in everything in life. And then finally have an end product that says I'd rather die than live. And he says, when you're sitting as a family, when you're sitting as a family with your children and your family members, they may not like it. But do you look at them into their eyes and into their face and ask them the question, do you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? God's not asking about our memory verses. 
God's asking if this is there. You will teach them when you sit, when you walk in the way, when you lie down, when you rise, you will bind them as a sign on your hand and, and it shall be on the frontlets of your eyes. You will write them on the doorposts of your house. Verse 10, and when the Lord your God brings you to the land that he swore to the fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with great and good cities that you did not build and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, cisterns that you did not dig and vineyards and all of trees that you did not plant and when you eat and you are full then take care lest you forget who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the houses of slavery lest when you get the TV lest when you get the music system lest when you get the sound system lest when you get the beautiful building and you get the and, and it's all on loan and you have a three bedroom house and you have a lovely position in the office and you've attained a good position and standing with the neighbors and, 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 and you money is increasing your riches is increasing everything is going up your bank account is going up you have newspapers to read you have news channels to watch you have God TV also sometimes to watch for entertainment he says you forget that when you sit down your heart must be communing with me For you will spend two hours in front of the TV and five minutes of family prayer. But nobody in the family has the guts to look into the eyes of the others and ask, do you really love Jesus? When's the last time you asked somebody in your family, do you really love Jesus? You see, that's what family prayer is supposed to be. That's what God's house is supposed to be. We give them the rules when we sit down. Thou shall not bunk tuitions. Thou shall not bunk the music class. You know how much I'm paying for it. Do you know that God has paid with blood for your family prayer? God has paid with blood for your Bible reading and devotion time. This is Christmas when God has gone before us. What kind of God? I, I find it crazy when families go out, bring presents, and they say, Santa Claus gave it. And when my kids were grown up, I bought them Christmas toys, but I never said Santa Claus gave it because I bought it out of my hard-earned money. And I brave bought it because I loved them. And I gave it to my children every Christmas, and I said, because Dada and Mama loves you. Because we love you. And the joy I have. Because my son came two days ago and he hugged his mother and kissed his mother. Came and hugged and kissed me and said, thank you, Dada. Oh, what a joy. What a joy. Uh, you know what I've seen other pro parents do? Okay, now sit and write a little letter, thank you letter to Santa Claus. What a waste. What a waste. What a waste of family. What a waste of parenthood. What a waste of marriage if marriage doesn't discuss love. What a waste of covenant. What a waste of inviting thousand people to your marriage and you cannot sit 20 years later and, and ask the question. That guy asked the question. You remember that Fiddler on the Roof movie? It looks at the Goldie, do you love me? And she says, for 25 years I washed your clothes, took care of your cows, milked your cows, done everything. And he looks at her and she's saying, I done all this for you. And he's looking at her and still asking you, but Goldie, do you love me? I'm asking that question today on your Christmas. You and I have the guts to go back home and ask, do you love God? Because if you love God, I know you love me. You see, there's problems in the family because the crisis is not between us. The crisis is a crisis of love for God. When love for God is hit, 
then love for one another is automatically hit because love for one another cannot come. Love for one another becomes dangerous. It becomes dangerous, I told you. We will love our children so much, we'll give them the mobile to kill themselves. We know that the, that the psychologists, we know that the scientists are telling us that the mobile is destroying the generation. But the word love is used when we put the mobile in their hands. The word love is used when we give them the wrong gifts that they are not yet old enough to use. And we say we love you. So, you know, that love is dangerous because that love is coming from your carnal behavior and is not a gift of God. When love is a gift of God and my son is asking for bread. What's his bread, dad? I want a bike. Bread is day-to-day -day stuff. I want a bike. And so I look at my son and say, yes, let's do it. And he says, Dad, it's got to be a thousand cc triumph. And I look at him and then I say, he's shaking his head already. <laughs> and I say, son, my love to give you your bread will not give you a snake. That's what Jesus said, right? No father... When his child asks for bread, will give him a snake. The same bread is converted to snake because it's coming out of a perverted love. Often papa and mama are in love with a lot of those things in the world. So they look at it and they want their kids to have it. And then they're looking in the Christmas drama. My child is my child in the front row. Got to show her dress. Got to show his jeans. Ah, is he in the front row? You know, today they, we had the Christmas program. He was in the second row. Could not see the child at all. <laughs> I mean, we, I'm saying, where is the crisis? The crisis is in the love that we've received. We don't have time to be with God, to receive God's love. The love you give away is a depraved love. It's from the world outside. If God hasn't put his love into our hearts. I have three points. I'm not going to go on the third. I just want to stop right there as you go back home. God is love. Love is not God. God is love. Because if love becomes God, then God gets contaminated. But when God is love, that love is holy because God is holy. That God, that love is honest, that love is truthful because God is honest, because God is truthful. Because God can never lie. That, you, that, that love is righteous because God is righteous. That love is kind, that love is patient, that love is forgiving. That love says, I, I don't want enemies. I, I want friends, I want people that I can love. And I like the way the Bible writes it. He says, if you don't know the love of God, you don't know the first thing, the first thing about God. Isn't it? It's so beautiful to live a life where you can love everybody, where you can love people. The life of love has so much of freedom. I was destroying my home when I wanted everything right. I wanted everything right. I wanted my family to do everything correct. And God said, it's not about being right. It's about love. If your family is not convinced that you love them, you can do everything correct and then find out that your child is not going to school and then find out years later that your son is on drugs and find out that something else is happening within the family. 
things will not go right, beloved ones. Things may not always be right, but in wrong circumstances, God does not go and say, just go and make the wrong right. He says, I'll tell you how to make the wrong right. Go there and love God. Men came to Jesus and said, what is the greatest commandment, Jesus? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul and mind and strength. And the second is like this because you can separate it. Love your neighbor. Love people. The way you love God. The gift. This is Christmas. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. That he gave his son. Beloved ones, when you get that love of God, you can love anybody. You can love everybody. Jesus makes you look at people beyond all the divisions in the world and says they are your brother, they are your sister. The Samaritan, Jesus told the story, Samaritan was walking on the road. He saw the person who his religious class did not like and he was on the ground. And Jesus said, who's his neighbor? Was it the priest that was in his temple or the man that was on the ground? But he found love when he found the man that was on the ground. You see, beloved ones, as we, as we pray just now, as we close the service just now, Christmas is not the cake. Christmas is not the dressing. Can you sit with your family today Look into the eyes of your child. Look into the eyes of your wife. Look into the eyes of your neighbors. Look into the eyes of people and be able to honestly tell them because God loves me, I love you. Because God loves me. The walls and the barriers suddenly disappear. Suddenly disappear. Because God is love.